Throughout history, media has been used by individuals, groups, and even states to target and vilify human beings and ultimately to spread hate. Hateful rhetoric has featured in books, magazines, posters, cartoons, radio, and television broadcasts that have successfully translated into real-world discrimination, hostility, and violence. In a 21st century, a new form of media, social media, is now being used by different actors to spread hatred at a speed and scale unseen before. Policymakers and online platforms in different parts of the world are playing catch up with the problem of online hate speech. But international law is an important tool to tackle this problem. The impact of online hate speech is very real and has been felt by different people around the globe. In Myanmar, hateful posts on social media have stirred violence against the Rohingya, a Muslim ethnic minority persecuted for decades in that country. According to a United Nations report, online hate has fueled war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even genocide. Atrocities like this don't happen in a vacuum. They need an enabling social, cultural, and political environment where hate speech thrives. But in the digital age, hate speech has had unprecedented consequences and raised unique challenges. This is because of the speed, scale, and directness with which content can be disseminated online by individuals and even botnets. We also need to consider the role of ranking and recommendation algorithms, which amplify sensationalist and hateful content and make it viral in a matter of seconds. On the flip side, we have also seen instances of perfectly legitimate types of speech being wrongly taken down by platforms automated content moderation systems. An example is the famous Napalm Girl photo, which was taken down and then reinstated by Facebook. So the challenge facing modern societies today is how to balance the benefits of free speech online with the need to counter the harmful consequences of online hate. So the core of hate speech and um, is the idea that speech, which is inciting people to, to do things which will be harmful, particularly violent things which will be harmful. That there are very few people who would disagree with that idea as being hateful speech, which is, which is dangerous speech. It's at the next step that we have greater debates. So that is speech which is demeaning in some way of people's equal dignity and equal worth in our society. And how you draw that line and, and what the consequences of trespassing across that line should be are very difficult. Um, it seems to me that at a pure level of kind of human kind of moral conduct, None of us should engage in speech which is demeaning of the equal worth of other people. However, translating that into a legal prohibition with consequences is quite difficult because what you think may be demeaning of my equal worth may not be what I think is demeaning. Uh, and we'll have, you know, thousands of different views. And also people's history and political context will inform that. So as a South African, coming from a society which was kind of built and imbued with deep racism, sensitivity about race, racialized language and racist language is obviously very high. Sensitivities may be entirely different in another society and they may run along lines of religion or they may run, run along you know, very different ethnic lines. So you do need to understand that any particular piece of speech is um, going to be influenced by the context in which it is made and making some generalized abstracted view as to whether it's hate speech or not without that context is probably impossible to do. Hate speech depends very much on context. It depends on the author or the speaker's intention, but it also uh, really involves a question of 
what the author thinks the audience will take away from that speech. And so speech that may constitute, let's say blasphemy that cannot be con uh, subject to prohibition under human rights law, that same speech in another context might in fact be understood by an audience as kind of a code toward incitement. And so hate speech, one of the difficulties with uh, identifying hate speech, criminalizing it, prohibiting it, is that its variation, its language, and its variation really depends to a large extent on the context in which that speech is taking place. The definition of hate speech is rather broad, and in practice, there's not a consensus definition. People generally use the term to refer to speech that denigrates another group of people. This could be a racial group, an ethnic group, religious group, um, sexual identity, it could be based on gender. But there's not an agreed upon definition of the actual term hate speech. Now, this can be difficult in practice because the line between someone expressing a genuine political opinion about a policy, for example, can be very thin when we're dividing that from what might count as hate speech. And in general, that line is set off the prevailing social norms, not on some objective definition that we all agree on. Where it gets tricky is that we know that hateful speech and dangerous speech are really context dependent. Um, speech may often seem benign uh, in one context and when understood by someone living in the context in which it's shared, it can be incredibly effective, dangerous speech, right? Because someone living in that context understands all of the cultural references and the specific um, kind of timing elements that might make that very inflammatory. Hate speech is a multifaceted phenomenon. It comes in different shapes and flavors, and no hateful content is created the same. And a lot depends on the context, because content and language are contextual. So we can't put all the types of hate speech into one box. What exactly is the challenge with hate speech online? Again, as with the principles, hate speech it's what constitutes hate speech, how we define it, hasn't changed because of the online world. What has changed is the scale and reach of speech itself. So we now have a far higher number of speakers being able to reach a far bigger audience than we've ever contemplated in the world before at greater rates. And that means that the practical problems of forms of regulation, implementation are in a scale entirely different to anything we've ever had before. So, so the difference is really just in the reach and scale of speech. I do think again that there is, I suppose, one other element to this, which is that there is something about the, um, the distance that is created by social media between the speaker and their audience which in some ways sort of encourages or fosters hate speech. And then that is amplified by the fact that attention is the, is the driver of social media. The online world has changed our understanding, or at least our discussion around hate speech in very significant ways. Right? So if we think about an analog world, or we think about you know, a purveyor of hate who is standing on Hyde Park corner and calling out all sorts of ideas of racial superiority. Um, you know, that person, you can really look at who's saying it and you can identify the audience that that person has. And so doing your assessment of the impact of the speech on that audience, you know, whether it is designed to essentially trigger that audience uh, to say commit acts of violence. So it's inciting that kind of, uh, that kind of step that's a lot easier to do than in the context of social media or other kinds of online tools. For one thing, it's very difficult to know who's the audience of a particular speaker. It's difficult to know from what a speaker says, what the tone is, what their intention is. It's difficult to know whether an audience actually understands the language of hatred, if it is actually language, language of hatred. 
as inciting something, as a call to some kind of action. And so in the social media space in particular, even though there's undeniably a huge amount of hateful speech, whether it actually constitutes the kind of speech that's restrictable under human rights law is really open to debate and is very difficult to determine. I suppose one other difference is that most forms of published media historically had, a, had an editorial eye, which prevented the most shocking things being said in many circumstances. So things that shock are the sorts of things that people share and like and, uh, and, and amplify. So it's, it's both this distance between the speaker and the audience, which sort of in some ways relaxes people and en en enables people to say things that they may well not say in a room of people because they know that it would be too shocking, that they can now say that the break between the, in, in, with absence from the audience is there. And then secondly, the way in which um, attention and shock is amplified on social media. We live in a world in which borders uh, to a significant extent, not entirely, um, but to a significant extent, are invisible to the way in which speech acts spread across the world through social media. Um, we need to recognize that, you know, speech has different implications in different places. Uh, and that's, that's a very difficult challenge. Up till now, mostly, these questions of hate speech have been determined within one particular domestic country setting. So whether you're from Brazil or South Africa or the UK, the, those decisions are made either by, um, you know, uh, uh, speech regulating organizations, whether it's broadcasting authorities or um, uh, uh, press uh, councils or um, media uh, tribunals or courts um, within that context. And everybody's in that context and the, the context is very obvious. It's, we're now moving into a world in which those decisions are being made cross-border where that context is not immediately apparent. Um, and, and that's a great challenge. But how exactly does online hate speech become viral? I, I have no doubt that the, the, like the events we're seeing around the world, things like Myanmar and Ethiopia, those are the opening chapters because engagement-based ranking does two things. One, it prior, prioritizes and amplifies divisive, polarizing, extreme content. And two, it concentrates it. It is about the systems of amplification that disproportionately give people saying extreme polarizing things the largest megaphone in the room. When you make a brand new account and you follow some mainstream interests, uh, for example, Fox News, Trump, Melania, it will lead you very rapidly to QAnon. It will lead you very rapidly to white genocide content. Yeah. But this isn't just true on the right, it's true on the left as well. Yeah. These systems lead to amplification and division. And, and I, I think you're right, like it's a question of like, uh, the system wants to find the content that will make you engage more, and that is extreme polarizing content. It is causing um, teenagers to be exposed to more anorexia content. It is pulling families apart. And in places like Ethiopia, it's literally fanning ethnic violence. Um, I encourage reform of these platforms, not, not picking and choosing individual ideas, but instead making the platforms themselves safer, less twitchy, less reactive, less viral, because that's how we scalably solve these problems. While technology, and in particular ranking and recommendation algorithms and platform business models play a significant role in the amplification of hateful content, social dynamics and factors are still key. There are many things that can be enticing about hate rhetoric and dangerous speech. Sometimes people have been convinced by speakers who have a certain authority in their lives that these often untrue statements that categorize another group of people as kind of less than their group, they've been convinced that these are true, right? And so there is a bit of a group mentality that they're kind of trying to establish their belonging with this group by supporting that speech. Sometimes this speech often can play to um, pre-existing fears. And this is something we see a lot with dangerous speech. Dangerous speech often plays off notions of threat or fear rather than off con con uh, specific conceptions of hate. And one reason why it becomes so enticing is that people see these threatening messages, these fearful messages, and they believe them. 
and then they want to warn their loved ones and friends about them. People choose to spread these messages and spread them quickly, not because they have these bad intentions of inciting violence or spreading hatred, but because they actually have good intentions of trying to warn the people that they care about of these threats. Now, the threats are often untrue, right? We know that. But even if this is misinformation, there are people who believe it and want to spread those messages. Is there a causal link to hate speech and real world harms? Now, uh, as we all know, there is a clear link between hate speech, uh, hate and violence. That uh, the Holocaust, which is uh, the quintessential uh, example of uh, genocide, did not happen out of the blue. It was not the Deus ex machina. Uh, there was an incredibly effective anti-Semitic anti campaign and annihilation campaign, led by Gables and others, and his uh, extremely well-organized uh, propaganda machine. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that hate speech uh, fell on fertile soil of anti-Semitism, uh, and not only in Germany. Uh, I would like to remind you of a famous statement of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who said the Holocaust was not simply the result of insanity of criminal Nazis. It was the culmination of centuries of hatred, scapegoating, and discrimination. We often see scholars and practitioners drawing a direct causal connection between speech and violence. But in practice, it's very difficult to isolate that causal connection. So rarely do we have evidence that a specific speech act caused a specific act of violence. Sometimes um, we do have these direct calls to violence, but they are normally coming on the tails of many other um, incidents of dangerous speech, things like dehumanization that have been spread throughout society. I'm much more convinced by arguments that suggest that speech has an impact on the environment in which people make decisions. So speech can make violence against members of another group of people seem acceptable or even necessary. Speech can make it seem that it would be very difficult or even dangerous to stand up to people who are pushing toward violence, pushing for violence. And as I said, sometimes there is speech that is a direct call to violence. Um, but in general, that is coming after we have already seen um, messages that have degraded and dehumanized another group that has made that violence seem acceptable. And while it's difficult to draw a clear and direct causal link between hate speech online or offline and actual violence or other real world harms, we can't ignore its impact on the overall context that is conducive to dangerous behavior. For example, there was a clear link between Donald Trump's tweets glorifying violence and misinforming the public and the January 6th riots in the United States Capitol building. And in fact, a committee set up by the United States Congress found that these tweets amounted to incitement to insurrection. There are many real world consequences of online hate. And we can think about those consequences both at the societal level and at the individual level. So at the societal level, when we're thinking about dangerous speech, there can be messages that convincingly make the case that members of another group pose a threat to the in-group. And when that happens, it can be um, inspiration for people to commit or condone actual offline violence against members of that out-group. Um, we also, we know that online hate can stoke division. It can lead to increased polarization and it can shift discourse norms to the point where this kind of hatred and vitriol seems normal, seems acceptable. And that can impact both the way that we speak to each other online and the way that we speak to each other offline. 
At the individual level, online hatred can make people feel targeted and it can isolate them um, from their communities. It can make the, um, the threat of violence or the threat of attack, both online attacks um, or offline attacks, it can make those threats feel real, feel possible, which might lead to people having to live in fear. Um, and more generally, it can make our online spaces of conversation so toxic and so threatening that people remove themselves from those debates and those conversations. And when that happens, when we're left with just the people who have the most extreme views, feeling safe to participate in those conversations, then we all lose something. We lose the ability to have reasoned debate about real policy issues. And that can lead to, um, it can impact the way that politicians speak, for example, or the kinds of policies that are enacted in our communities. So there are many real world impacts for online hatred. Sadly, some hate speech, which does not explicitly advocate violence, does in contemporary reality result in violence and politically, ethnically, or religiously motivated killings. And when we read and read again about the repeated killings, for example, in American schools, we really wonder whether the present system is strong enough to prevent these kinds of events. So how does international law address the phenomenon of online hate speech and the difficult dilemmas that come with it? And here, different international legal rules and regimes come into play, such as international human rights law, and international criminal law. And the Genocide Convention, inspired by uh, the Holocaust, treats direct and public incitement to genocide as a distinctive separate act of genocide as a crime in itself, an inchoate crime, which is punishable if, even if acts of genocide do not result from that particular incitement after 6th April 1994, without a firearm, machete, or any physical weapon, you caused the deaths of thousands of innocent civilians. In the case of Rwanda, for example, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda found that inflammatory and dehumanizing radio broadcasts amounted to serious international crimes. However, whether or not less serious forms of hate speech online or offline should be criminalized remains controversial. The famous media case, of course, the formal titles Nahimana and others, and in that case, the ICTR appeals chamber considered the responsibility of persons involved in broadcasting and newspaper writings of hate speech and incitement to genocide. The ICTR Appeals Chamber distinguished between the crime of genocide committed through instigation as a mode of liability on the one hand and the crime of direct public and direct incitement to commit genocide on the other. The tribunal has drawn clear, just clear lessons from World War II. Propaganda for Holocaust can lead and did lead to atrocities such as the Holocaust and must be criminalized as soon as the pronouncement is made without awaiting its catastrophic consequences. So international human rights law actually doesn't define a term hate speech. Uh, it comes up in different contexts though. So for example, Article 20, Paragraph 2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is really our hate speech provision in the ICCPR, right? And that uh, prohibits or it requires states to prohibit advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to hostility, discrimination, or violence. And that's colloquially thought of as the hate speech provision, but I think the important thing to note there is that it's not a pure speech prohibition, right? It's a prohibition that says, 
advocacy that constitutes one of these things, it must be connected to incitement. So as an international law definition, I think that's the best place to start, that, that hate speech involves advocacy of hatred that constitutes uh, incitement. It's not the only place where hate speech, at least our colloquial understanding of hate speech, comes up. The International uh, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, I know a mouthful, the CERD, um, it also requires the essentially the criminalization of the dissemina dissemination of ideas of racial superiority. The interesting thing over time has been that the definitions, those very different kinds of definitions, you know, one that includes incitement and one that seems a little bit more oriented towards a kind of pure speech prohibition, they've converged in the interpretation by the monitoring committees, the Human Rights Committee and the CERD Committee. So there's a very interesting development where hate speech, if we want to call it that, has been understood as a human rights law concept as involving some form of incitement. And what about hate speech short of incitement? So our default setting, and the default setting for human rights law, is that everyone enjoys the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds. And that information and ideas of all kinds is really important because it's categorical. And, and it doesn't distinguish in the right between hate speech and other kinds of speech, disinformation and fact, truth and lies. So it really requires us to go to context. But is freedom of expression an infected right? It's true that international law doesn't prohibit states from dealing with, uh, you know, hate speech, if we want to call it that, that is short of incitement. But, and this is true of connections to Article 20 as well, when the state wants to restrict that kind of speech, if we want to call it hate speech, let's say it's advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred, or another ground of discrimination in the ICCPR. The state still has to demonstrate that it meets the requirements of Article 19 of the ICCPR, which involve essentially a three-part test of legality, legitimacy, and necessity and proportionality. So it's possible for a state to argue, for example, let's think about the zone of uh, historical genocide denial. So Holocaust denial is an example where, on the one hand, the Human Rights Committee, the monitoring body for the ICCPR, has essentially said that it's inconsistent with the ICCPR to prohibit uh, disputes over historical, um, over genocides. Um, on the other hand, a state might argue that that kind of genocide denial interferes with, say, uh, public order or the rights and reputations of others. I'm not saying I support that kind of argument, but a state might argue that, and if it can demonstrate the necessity of, uh, of some kind of prohibition, hate speech short of incitement might fall into that category. So, so if we think about hate speech that's short of incitement, we can think of any number of, of examples, right? They might be examples where an individual uh, criticizes, and let's say criticizes harshly, another person's religion. Um, or a person who's within that religious space criticizes some conventional tenets of that religion. Oftentimes, a state actually uses that kind of criticism as an argument for hate speech. They say, well, that constitutes hate speech. But generally speaking, in human rights law, it's been understood that claims of blasphemy cannot constitute hate speech, that blasphemy, or at least arguments around religious beliefs, should be open. Those are part of the freedom of expression that's protected by Article 19 of the ICCPR and the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. What factors should we take into account when limiting hate speech? So the first thing that we look at is the speaker. Does this speaker have authority, right? Do they have the ability to make people believe what they are saying? Now, this authority can come from a variety of sources. Um, that person may have a political office or some kind of official social status, which gives them um, a lot of clout. They may also just be someone who is very popular or charismatic. They might have authority based on 
their religious status. They could be a religious figure or even just a respected member of the community that is seen as trustworthy. So all of these things can give more power to what that person is saying. The second thing that we look at is the audience, right? So what might be happening with members of the audience that might make them more willing to hear and believe that message? The third thing that we look at is the message itself, right? So what, uh, what kinds of, we call them hallmarks, what kinds of rhetorical patterns exist in that speech? that play up this idea of threat. These can be things like dehumanization or something called accusation in a mirror, which is suggesting that members of the other group um, are about to take some kind of action against the in-group, when in reality, it's the in-group that is planning to take the action against the out-group. And messages like that can make violence seem not only acceptable, but necessary because it shifts someone into the frame of mind of self-defense. Um, we also look at the social and historical context. What has happened in this particular place in the past or what is happening right now that might affect the way that this message can be believed? A good example of this would be, is there a history of violence between the two groups in question? If so, then those messages suggesting that there is a threat of violence in the future might be more believable. Um, this can also apply to things like um, the legal structure. Does one of the groups have, or do they experience fewer rights in the country um, than the other group? All of these things can play into the dangerousness of the speech. And the last piece of the framework that we look at is something called medium. So this just means the way that the message is spread. Um, is it spread on Facebook? Is it spread in person or in a sermon? So the manner in which the speech um, reaches the audience can impact how much power it has. Why is legislation so important? So one of the main principles that allows a state to limit expression, right, is the legality principle. And as we understand legality, that means not only that there's a law that forms the basis for a restriction, but it's also that that law is precise enough in order to limit executive branch, let's say, or state discretion, and also to guide individual behavior. But it also means that that should be subject to some kind of judicial, independent judicial check. So that when the state restricts, let's say, hate speech, it should be essentially evaluated by public courts. Why does international law matter? One of my hopes is that moving forward, states in the kind of domestication of international human rights law actually make use of these excellent tools that have been created by human rights experts in order to deal with these really difficult problems. When thinking about hate speech in particular, and particularly thinking about the global setting, it's important, I think, for any regulator, any decision maker, to acknowledge the importance of context and not to assume, because we all do, that everywhere is looks like where we know well. That's just not how the world is. And a certain institutional humility and a recognition that we need to understand well the context in which this particular speech act has taken place uh, seems to me to be important. And that is, I think, the first thing we need to think about. International human rights law provides really robust protections for freedom of expression. And, and they're, they're robust, but they also are borderless in a way. And because we're talking about, in the context of hate speech, rules that apply to global or should apply to global phenomenon, um, phenomena of, of hatred, it makes sense that hate speech, that international human rights law applies to hate speech and that both states apply human rights law, but also that companies, in their consideration of how to deal with this problem, that they apply human rights law as well but how to apply the international legal framework in practice. So this is a really interesting part of social media, which is if we think about the state's reaction to hate speech, it has pretty limited tools, right? Particularly in an analog or public setting, right? And its tools are if somebody is speaking hatefully and seeking to incite violence, the tools of the state are essentially to restrict, to muzzle, to 
detain a person, to bring a civil claim against the person. They're pretty, you know, pretty simplistic in a way. They're like that old idea that, you know, if you have a hammer, you're gonna look for a nail. So they're very direct sorts of blunt instruments. Social media, I mean, for all of the problems around hateful content uh, on online, social media has different kinds of options, right? So the companies don't merely have to take the option of uh, deplatforming, right? Kicking somebody off the platform or taking their content off the platform, which that looks like our traditional way of thinking about muzzling speech. But they have these other tools. They can deal with, for example, the algorithm. So are the recommendation systems that might promote that kind of hateful content, are those designed to limit the virality of the content, which might be a helpful way to deal with hate speech without actually silencing a partic particular speaker. Another possibility would be to label it. Another possibility might be to downrank it in some way. What about the role of algorithms? I strongly encourage reforms that push us towards human scale social media and not computer driven social media. Those amplification harms are caused by computers choosing what's important to us, not our friends and family. And I encourage any system that children are exposed to to not use amplification systems. My own sense is that this collision between these two very important values, the one is freedom of speech and the other is limiting harmful hate speech, uh, it creates a, an intersection between the two of them which is going to mean that we're always going to be a gray area in the middle where many of us will reasonably disagree on whether this speech is a form of speech that should be prohibited or permitted. And so algorithms are not going to be able to resolve that. That's actually a normative clash which exists. It can't be written away by a clever technology just as much as it can't be written away by clever and wise judges. Beyond that, I, I, I do accept that we may get better at recognizing technologically the, the clear cases that fall on one side or the other of the line. This is something that should be protected as free speech, and this is something that is, 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 um, should not be protected because it does constitute hate speech. We need to recognize that there's always going to be a ban down the middle, uh, and that ban is going to be vary in different contexts and vary over time, but it's always going to give rise to reasonable disagreement. There's not a binary here. On the other hand, states are really seeking to regulate this space, and they're often doing so in a way that is still rooted in a kind of binary way of thinking about speech and what, what the online platforms are able to do. And so just as much as we might want the platforms, and I would argue, that the platforms in deciding how to deal with what they see as hate speech or what might be hate speech. They should be using human rights standards to assess that because human rights provides us with a kind of global language and, and essentially the tools to assess speech. The bottom line is that there's no silver bullet and no one size fits all approach to tackling online hate speech. But international law is an important piece of the puzzle that we need to crack in order to mitigate the harmful consequences that online hate may lead to.